Khan Academy are cracking that nut for all of us, teachers, parents, and educators. Please join me in welcoming Salman Khan. Welcome, Salman. Yeah, good. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Thanks a bunch. Very exciting to be here. So, so before I, I start, I like to get a sense of, of where the audience is and, and how much they, they might know about Khan Academy. How many of you all have either used it or are somewhat familiar with the site to a certain degree? Oh, very good. Very good. How many, how many of you have used it with your kids? Your kids actively use the site and some, oh, this is very exciting. All right, very good. So, so just, just to start off, uh, there, there were some of you all that didn't raise your hands. Uh, to, to, get, to get everyone on the same page, uh, Khan Academy is most known for this collection of videos, and I'll talk a little bit about how all of this got started, but I, I literally started making for my cousins. And so I'll show a montage of those videos, and you'll see what, what they feel like. And then you'll also see uh, some of the other video directions we're going in. Not all of them are made by me anymore, and we're starting to experiment with uh, so, some other styles. So let me just show you what that looks like. We could integrate over the surface, and the notation usually is a capital sigma. All of these interactions are just due to the gravity over interstellar, or almost you could call it intergalactic. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here. Notice this is an aldehyde, and it's an alcohol. This is their 30 million plus the $20 million from the American manufacturer. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. This Botticelli. is not Eve. No, Botticelli's portrayed the ancient goddess of love. This is 6 times 6 times 6, or 216. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. Let's just, like, make it 11. Play with the pendulum and get a feel for how it moves. Function as a bridge rectifier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. <laughs> I can, uh, I, I can always tell the intelligence of an audience based on how much they appreciate Euler's identity, so y'all have, uh, y'all have passed that, passed that. So just to give a snapshot of where we are now, uh, we've, uh, we, we've, reached 75 million unique students uh, since kind of this adventure began. Uh, over, I think actually the numbers are now 240 million uh, videos have been watched. We actually just crossed our billionth exercise. I know the slide says 900 million, but our billionth exercise uh, literally a couple of weeks ago, uh, we're being used in 20,000 classrooms. Uh, and, and you know what you saw now is just the videos. But what I want to do uh, is rewind a little bit and tell, talk about how all of this got started, and then talk about where we see Khan Academy going, because we think it's a lot more than, than just the videos that, that, that I initially started making for, for family. So if you, were, if you rewind back to 2004, I was, uh, my background is originally in computer science, but uh, I had gone to business school. I now found myself, I was an analyst at a hedge fund, and uh, I had just gotten married. And I, uh, uh, I had some family visiting me from New Orleans, which is where I grew up. They were visiting me up in, up in Boston. And while they were there, uh, it was uh, three of my cousins and, and their parents, my uncle and aunt. And uh, the oldest of my cousins, Nadia, who was 12 years old at the time, it just came out in conversation at some point that she was having trouble in mathematics. And so I said, well, you know, Nadia, you, know, you seem like a very bright young woman. What, what, what seems to be the problem? And she said it was unit conversion. And I said, no, you know, like, I'm completely convinced that you can tackle unit conversion. And she thought it was just one of these empty pep talks. I could kind of sense that she was rolling her eyes inside of her brain. And uh, so I said, I, I kind of view that as a little bit of a challenge. So I said, okay, how about this? You go back to New Orleans. I'm, I'm in Boston. Uh, every day after work for me, after school for you, uh, I tutor you. And, and, and we try to get you past this threshold. And uh, I, I think she was excited that, you know, just someone was willing to take this, the time out for her. And so she agreed. And so they went back to New Orleans. And long story short, uh, you know, every day we worked together. It was difficult at first. She'd kind of psyched herself out, convinced herself that she was no good at mathematics. Uh, but about a month into it, she, she was able to, things clicked, and she was able to catch up. Then she actually started to get a little bit ahead of the curve, a little bit ahead of where uh, her class might be. And at that point, I like to say I became what I, what, what I call a, a tiger cousin. And I, um, I, I, I called up her, her school. Um, and I said, you know, I really think uh, Nadia needs to retake the placement exam, go into the faster math track. And, and they said, well, who are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm her cousin. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a theme that, that I guess 
you'll see many times over the next few minutes, but I've seen many times over the last few years, starting with Nadia, is that that same girl who entering seventh grade thought she was no good at math and thought that she couldn't comprehend unit conversion, uh, by her sophomore year in high school was taking calculus at the, at the local university. And something we're going to see over and over again is that people who thought they were bad at something are able to just, uh, if they're able to fill in the gaps in their knowledge, are able to uh, all of a sudden race ahead. But I was kind of hooked. I, I worked with Nadia. Then I started working with her, uh, her younger brothers. Uh, then the firm that I was uh, uh, working for, uh, I, you know, I use the firm very broadly. It was uh, my boss and his dog. Uh, we, um, the dog was the chief economist. We, uh, we, we, we ended up moving out to Northern California. My boss's wife got a, a job as a professor at Stanford Law. And the, the first Khan Academy, most people don't realize it because the videos have kind of, uh, kind of have a life of their own. The first Khan Academy was actually a little piece of software that I had written for my cousins to kind of give them practice problems. I noticed that they, didn't, they weren't really proficient at a lot of things that you would expect someone in f fifth or sixth or seventh grade to know. Um, I was somewhat suspicious of whether they were doing the work, so I put a database behind it. And um, you, you fast forward to 2006, I was at a dinner party with a friend, and, and all my friends knew I had this kind of crazy project with my cousins, and I was uh, showing off the software that I had written, these things that generate exercises for them. And, uh, and they all knew that I had, I had this, this, this project. Uh, but you know, word had gotten around in the family that, that free tutoring was going on. And so I found myself now tutoring every day after work about 10 or 15 cousins and family members and, and whatever else. And, and my friend, he's like, oh, Sal, you know, this software is really cool, but how are you dealing with, you know, being able to coordinate all of these tutoring sessions? And I'm like, you know, it's actually getting really, really difficult. And he's the first person to tell me, well, there's this YouTube thing. Why don't you make, some of, why don't you make videos of some of your lessons, put them up on YouTube. Maybe your, your cousins would find it useful. And, and I immediately thought it was a horrible idea. I said, no, 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 no. YouTube is for cats playing piano. It's <laughs> not for serious mathematics. Uh, but I... Uh, I, I literally went home that weekend, got over the idea that it wasn't my idea, uh, and, I, I, uh, and I, I, I gave it a shot. And, uh, you know, I, I, those first few videos were kind of on algebra and pre-algebra and whatever else. Um, and, and I made about 10 or 20 of them. They were little, little 10 minute long videos. And I started telling my cousins, look, if you're confused about something, you want to review something, uh, uh, there's, these videos are there for you. And after about a few months, I asked for feedback. And you know, they, they somewhat backhandedly told me that, that they preferred me on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and uh, viewing, viewing the positive angle of that feedback, I, I, I think it actually made a lot of sense. They were saying, look, they appreciated the time I was spending with them. They appreciated the tutorials. But the first time that you learn something, it's stressful to have someone say, oh, are, are, do you understand this now? Or a lot of times, you might be in seventh or eighth or ninth grade, and you forgot some concept from fourth or fifth grade. And you might be embarrassed to tell your cousin. And so you can now review it at your own time and pace. Uh, when people coordinate time, it, you know, they might have other things going on in their day. They might have a lot of homework that night. Now they could access the content when they're ready, when they're ready to access it. So I, I view that as positive feedback, and I just kept going, adding more and more and more and more content. Uh, then it became clear uh, soon enough on YouTube that, that there were people who were not my cousins who were watching. And uh, you know, at first, the comments were just, you know, thank you, this really helped, I really appreciated this. And, and even that was a pretty big deal. I don't know how much uh, time you all have spent on YouTube, uh, but the comments don't always be, aren't always that positive, and, uh, or, or even G-rated. And, 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 and then the comments got really interesting. There started to be things like, you know, hey, this is the reason I was able to go back to college. This is the reason why I'm now a physics major. Uh, this is the reason why after leaving the, the military, I can go back and major in engineering. And uh, you know, we, I got crazy emails. Uh, one family said, uh, thank you so much for this resource. My entire family uh, prays for your entire family every evening. And, and you have to put things in perspective. I was an analyst at a hedge fund. We didn't have a lot of people praying for us. I was, I, I was, maybe our investors every, every now and then. So, so I, I, I just kept going and going and going. Um, and in 2008, I set it up as a, a not-for-profit. Even at that point, I didn't really imagine that it was, you know, my, my, I guess my for-profit career was going well, and I, and I just assumed that, hey, maybe I'll, I'll just do the for-profit thing. I'll set this up as a not-for-profit. Maybe at some point I could get some grants for it or maybe get a couple of people to work on it, but I didn't really think of that as, as something that might overtake my life. 
But then as, as little as a year after that, 2009, it had overtaken my life. At this point, uh, there was several hundred thousand people who were using the site uh, every month. I was getting hundreds of emails every week. I was sneaking away and making videos in every kind of uh, free time that I had. And so I, I sat down with my wife. We had a, a, a little bit of savings. Sometimes I'm introduced as a hedge fund manager, and I make it very clear now I was the analyst. There's a different pay grade. Otherwise, it would have been a much easier decision, and I would be dressed a little bit better. But the... Um, but I was an analyst, and, and, and so we, we had some savings, about enough, about a year's worth of savings, uh, but we didn't own a house. Our, our, our son had just been born, uh, but, you know, my wife understood that this kind of o had overtaken my life, and, and I said, look, you know, someone's got to appreciate in the next year. We'll give ourselves a year. Someone should appreciate that there's almost an infinite social return on investment here, that I could keep on making videos. We could do the interactive software, et cetera, et cetera. It could reach millions and millions and millions, maybe one day billions of students. And so I kind of took that leap of faith, and I think like a lot of entrepreneurial stories, you start off very uh, naively optimistic. You're already starting to talk some, to some foundations. You just assume, yeah, no, this is a no-brainer for them. They're definitely going to fund this. And uh, they don't. And uh, a, few, a, few, a few months go by, and you know, in, in all honesty, about nine months went by, and I, I started getting pretty insecure. And I, you know, there was even a night where I started literally updating my resume and um, uh, thinking that I would, I would go back into the world that, that I had come from. And right when I was, right around that same time, I, I had some, I had a, a place where people could send in donations. There was a little PayPal link. And I was getting $50 donations, $5 donations. Every now and then a $100 donation would come in. And, and that, that did help pay the bills, but uh, we were digging into our savings to the tune of about, about five or $6,000 a month. And uh, right when that was happening, all of a sudden a $10,000 donation came in. And so I immediately see who this is from. Her name was Ann Doer. Uh, her, she was based in Palo Alto. Uh, so I immediately sent her an email. I said, you know, thank you so much for this very generous donation. Uh, this is the largest donation that the Khan Academy has ever received. If we were a physical school, you would not have a building named after you, <laughs> which, which I've now discovered is quite inexpensive for me. It gets, gets you a bench at most, most universities. Uh, and she immediately emailed me back and said, well, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you're doing. Let's, let's, let's have lunch. And so we literally, I think it was like a, a, a week later, we had lunch in downtown Palo Alto at a little Indian buffet restaurant. And uh, Anne said, well, you know, what, 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 what are you trying to do? What's your goal? And I said, look, when I filled out the paperwork with the IRS, they have a little line that says mission statement. And I said, well, I don't know, a, a free world-class education for anyone anywhere? And Anne said, well, that's optimistic. Uh, that, that's ambitious. Um, how do you plan on doing that? And I said, well, I want to keep making videos, but I could imagine... Uh, building the interactive software even more, the stuff that I started making with my cousins, feedback, dashboards, tools for teachers, ways for kids to communicate online. We can internationalize it so anyone on the planet can, can, can possibly access it. And she said, well, you know, this is strangely enough, it seems like you're on track to do this. Uh, how are you supporting yourself? And in as proud of a way as possible, I said, I'm not. <laughs> and so... Uh, and kind of nodded, and, and we parted ways. I, she got on her bicycle, I got into my car, and uh, I drove home. Well, ten minutes later, I'm driving into the driveway, and I got a text message from Ann. And it said, uh, you really need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. So, so it was a good day. It was <laughs> on balance. And, you know, frankly, that was the beginning of a whole cascade of stranger and stranger events. Uh, you fast forward two months, I was running, you know, I was like this virtual teaching guy, and I was curious, what, what could you do with a physical environment if it's not based on lecture anymore? And so I had this little summer camp where I had uh, uh, about 25 middle school students, and I had six of them play a game of risk, and then I had the other, the remainder of the students trade securities based on the outcome of the game of risk. And uh, what one 12-year-old actually invented naked shorting, and so I told him I could introduce him to some people, they could, um, he could do quite well. But uh, while that was happening, I got another actually series of text messages from Anne. And at this point, I take her text messages very seriously. <laughs> and uh, they, they, it was actually hard to read, but it read along the lines of, I'm at the Aspen Ideas Festival right now at the, in the main pavilion, Bill Gates on stage, talking about Khan Academy last five minutes. And so I immediately boot the nearest seventh grader off of a computer 
And I, and I start looking for evidence that this, you know, what is Anne talking about? And I soon found people tweeting about it. I would find even blog posts were starting to come out. In a few hours, I was able to find actual footage of the event. And uh, Bill, Bill Gates on stage with Walter Isaacson talking about how he uses this thing called the Khan Academy with his kids. He uses it himself, uh, which actually was a little bit scary for me. Uh, <laughs> those videos were for Nadia, not, not for Bill Gates. Um, and, and then I went home that evening kind of just confused and not sure what to do next. I mean, you know, do I call him? Do I, what's the protocol here? And, and, and they left me in that somewhat bizarre state for the next two weeks. And so two weeks later, I'm literally in you know, the, the world headquarters of the Khan Academy, which was our walk-in closet. And I, I was making a video and then all of a sudden I get a, I get a call from Seattle. So this is intriguing, I, I answer the phone, hello. And uh, on the other side, oh, this is Larry Cohen. I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. Uh, you might have heard that Bill's a fan. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, um, if you have some time in the near future, we would love to fly you up to Seattle and, and figure out how we can support you. And at that moment, I was looking at my calendar for, for the month, uh, completely blank. <laughs> so I said, yeah, you know, I got to cut my nails on Wednesday. But other than that, I think I could, I could fly up and meet Bill Gates. Uh, so uh, all of that worked out, went, met with Bill Gates, uh, they decided to support us, uh, be able to hire up a team. Right at around that same time we were also meeting with the folks at Google, I mean all of these things are just these independent events that just came together all at once. Uh, they also decided to support us in a significant way. And about, this is about two and a half years ago, not that long ago, we were up and running and we were kind of ready to build what I had first described to Anne. And what you see here, you know, this is kind of a, I, I like to show this because it, it kind of gives a framework for how we think about how kids can interact and learn with the system. This is what we call our knowledge map. Each of those nodes are concepts in mathematics. So you saw the videos, they go much broader than mathematics. Right now our interactive portion is mainly math. Over time, we hope that the interactive will also be in, in, in quite possibly every, every subject. But what you see here is the, the higher you go, there are more basic concepts. And as students show proficiency or mastery in the more basic concepts, it then moves them down to more advanced concepts. And it's kind of an obvious idea. It's how you would play a video game. You master level one, then you go to level two. It's how you would learn a martial art. It's how you would learn a musical instrument. But the thing that I always point out is this is not the way that you are taught in a traditional classroom. In a traditional classroom, you group kids by age, you push them through in kind of an assembly line factory model, and it's actually no coincidence, this model was developed really during the Industrial Revolution. At different points in time, usually state mandated, you kind of try to apply information to them. Some kids get the information, some kids don't. Even if a kid gets a C on, say, basic exponents, that's, and you identify those weaknesses, you move on to negative exponents or fractions or something more advanced, even though you know that, that they, they, had, they had weaknesses in something more basic. And the analogy I draw there is imagine if you were building a house and you get the contractors and you tell the contractors, look, we have, the state tells me we have exactly three weeks to build this foundation. Do what you can. So the contractor does what they can. Uh, you get the inspector to show up after two, three weeks and the inspector says, well, yeah, I don't know. The concrete's still a little bit wet right over there. This part right over here isn't quite up to code. I would give it an 85%. They say, great, that's a C. Let's build the first floor. And you build the first floor, you know, two weeks of, you know, you tell the contractor, look, you just have to spend two weeks. I don't care if the supplies don't show up. I don't care if it rains. Do what you can. Inspector shows up, 75%. Great, let's build the second floor. And you do that floor after floor after floor. And then all of a sudden, while you're building the fourth floor and the whole thing collapses, you blame the contractor. You say, oh my God, I had a horrible contractor. Or maybe you say, oh, we didn't inspect good enough. But the reality is maybe those things were fine but you, the process was broken. The inspector was identifying weaknesses, but you completely ignored them and you moved on to the next concept. And this is essentially what's happening in, in our schools every day. And so what we're saying is, look, instead of holding fixed when and how long you have to learn something, and the variable is how well you learn it, pretty much ensuring that you end up with all of these gaps that are gonna make you hit a wall later on in your, in your career, Let's make the variable how long you have to learn it and when you learn it, essentially personalize the instruction for your needs. But the fixed thing is that you have a high level, a high level of mastery. Now this is just an example of, of what it, some of these exercises look like. Uh, I showed, you know, we mentioned that a billion of these have been done. And I like to show this one, this is kind of like Montessori for calculus. It kind of shows you that you can change the slope of the tangent line at any point and by, by doing that you're essentially plotting the derivative. 
You know, when, when I, we started this whole thing, I, I assumed Khan Academy was just going to be this thing outside of classrooms. That, you know, the, the, the school system was this bureaucratic thing with a lot of inertia. But right when we got some of that first funding, a local school district reached out to us, Los Altos, and said, look, what would you do with a fifth grade classroom now with your tools? And we said, look, we don't think there's a reason to use class time for this passive one-size-fits-all lecture. The students can get it on demand. I told them how my cousins like that even more. Uh, and we could use class time for ma more valuable things, for interacting with the teacher, for peer-to-peer -peer instruction. The irony here is if the kids could learn at their own time and pace, off, when they're not in the classroom, the classroom could become a more human experience because they had this technology. And, and somewhat surprising to us, they, they said, in a, yeah, this, this is exactly consistent with differentiated instruction, mastery-based learning, these concepts that have been in education circles forever, and we want to do it. So we started a pilot, and what you see here is uh, some of the dashboards from that initial pilot, and it gives you an idea of how these classrooms could work. So each row is there. It's kind of like a spreadsheet. Each row there is a, a student in the class. Each of those columns is one of those concepts that you saw on that knowledge map. Green means that a student's proficient. Blue means that they're working on it. And red means that a student is stuck on it. And the model is a teacher can walk around, literally updates in real time, it shows up on their tablet, and they could say, okay, that student's having trouble with exponents three, there's a couple of students who've already mastered that, maybe I can set up a little peer tutoring between them. Or if they're still having trouble, maybe I can sit down and do a very focused intervention. Or maybe if a bunch of students have already mastered a certain concept, I can now do more interactive, maybe a project based on, based on that type of a concept. This next chart or graph, I mean, we have a ton of dashboards for teachers so that we can really give them the type of analytics, frankly, the type of analytics that we were seeing before and the marketing analytics or the type of analytics that I had when I was a, an analyst at a hedge fund, we can finally give that to a teacher so they can in real time slice and dice what all of their students are up to. But I like to show this one because above it, you know, ab above and beyond just showing a report, it, it, it talks about a very powerful narrative, essentially the same narrative that I had first seen with Nadia. The horizontal axis there is just time. It's just days on the site. The vertical axis is just a count of how many of those modules a student has shown proficiency in. And each of those lines is a student in a classroom. And what you see is, and just like any math classroom, right when you start, there's a group of kids, very steep slope. They start advancing really fast. There's a group of kids in the middle. And then there's a group of kids who are really slow to start. Those are the flatter lines. And in a traditional model, you say, oh, those kids who are racing ahead, those are the, those are the honor students. Those are the kids who are you know, going to go to college, become engineers and doctors and all the rest. We have our kids in the middle and our kids in the, the, the slow kids. Yeah, maybe those kids are, are the remedial students. But what we're seeing is if you let every student learn at their own pace, if you let them fill in the gaps that you thought uh, that, that they weren't able to fill in before, the same students that we thought were, were remedial, 10 days into the process, or mediocre 10 days into the process, and this blue student is one of them, and actually it clips off a little bit on the right, but it, on the right, it, even at, at day 70-something, you see that they're the third, third best student, but this student actually ends up becoming the second best student in the class. And we're seeing this over and over and over again in every classroom that we've worked with, whether we're talking about public schools, private schools, rich neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, wherever it is, many of the kids that even in two months that you thought were slow, you thought were remedial, you let them fill in that gap, even though it's an algebra class, you let them make sure they know their multiplication tables, know that multiplying decimals, adding fractions, negative numbers, they can become the, the best student in the class. The, uh, you know, the other, oh, yeah. The, the uh, you know, right now, 20,000 classrooms are using us in some way, shape, or form. I want to make it clear, all of this, we're, we're completely free. It's all not for profit. All of these dashboards that I'm showing you, you could start using it with your cousins. You can volunteer and, at your local boys and girls club or your local school, and you can be the coach, and you would have the same tools that uh, uh, the, the teachers in Los Altos have. But with that, we like to remind ourselves that still the bulk of our users, even though we have 400,000 in classrooms, uh, the bulk of our users, uh, the, the other uh, five and a half million, are just people out there with just trying to tap into their potential. And what this next video at least shows us, and, and hopefully shows you as well, is just how much potential there is out in the world if we just give people the tools to, to actually tap into it. My name is Mark Halberstadt. Growing up, uh, I was really always a C student. I, I think I was really pretty much always pretty pitiful in school. I don't think I've ever gotten higher than a B plus in any math class ever, uh, particularly. I pretty much thought that the only thing I was good enough to do in college was major in music. And I went off and I uh, got a music degree in saxophone, 
but I, I sort of almost felt that it was more I was getting it because I was terrible at everything else. Kind of worked as a saxophone player for a few years. Really what I wanted to do was uh, do electrical engineering. And the last thing that I remember completely not getting was trig identities. So I went to YouTube and I did a search for trig identities and the Khan Academy was the first thing that popped up. Watched a bunch of videos in the trig playlist to kind of get caught up to speed. I watched all the videos in the calculus playlist. I watched all the videos in the physics playlist. Watched a bunch of videos on dividing decimals and even uh, on a uh, subtraction by borrowing. I watched uh, a lot of videos on, on arithmetic. That was in 2007. I did that uh, until the fall of 2010 and in the fall 2010 I, uh, I took a leap and I decided to go uh, go back to school and went to uh, Temple University, majored in electrical engineering, getting a second bachelor's. And keep in mind, I, I don't think I've ever gotten above a B plus in math classes, and I was really a straight C student growing up. And I just finished this year, first year back in college, I got a 4.0 GPA for the entire year. I got perfect scores on both of my calc final exams and also on my chemistry final exam. I ended uh, calculus, chemistry, both calculus classes, Calc 1, 2, and chemistry with an average higher than 100%. I, there are some Khan Academy videos that I probably listen to the same concept over 20 or 30 times. And there is no tutor in the world I could have paid to have sat next to me and repeated the same thing over 20 or 30 times without at least them getting a little bit judgmental or at least them getting, thinking like, oh, well, this guy really is never going to get this concept and he should just give up. Where the understanding really happened was watching those videos and, and also working through the Khan Academy software and everything. The impact for me in my life, I, I really see it growing exponentially over the next 20 or 30 years. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, Thank you. And Mark is now a junior and still has a 4.0 GPA, so he's doing quite well. Maybe he'll apply for an internship with some of you guys, so keep a, keep a lookout. So the, the one thing that might, some of y'all might have been thinking about, and I even saw that map where some of y'all are from, is you know, everything I've been focused on so far has been the English-speaking world, uh, the developed world, but the implications on the developing world uh, could be even larger, where uh, you have lack of resources, where even if you have the resources, you might not be able to find teachers, where the kids have all sorts of, uh, they're at all different types of skill levels. And so we've started to have other groups uh, take what we're doing, other not-for-profits for the most part, but even some governments, uh, take our stuff and start to deploy it all over the world. And these are pictures of Khan Academy being used in, in, in various parts of the world. And each of these are, are exciting stories. Uh, but the one for us that's kind of been the most mind-blowing is the one up there in the top right. Um, you know, I used to give talks like this about a year ago and say, you know, one day this might be used in Mongolia. And uh, about a little after that, I, I got an email from Mongolia. It was actually from Zaya, the, the girl in the top right. And she actually sent a YouTube thank you, not too different than what you just saw from Mark Halberstadt. And uh, I assume she must be a, a middle class girl. She has access to, to YouTube and, and whatever else. Uh, but then I, I read the email in more depth, and it turned out that there was a group from Silicon Valley who, in their vacation time, a group of engineers was going to Mongolia and setting up uh, a kind of a computer labs in orphanages. And what you see there, the top right, uh, those are girls in a Mongolian orphanage uh, using Khan Academy. And Zaya was one of the orphans. And that by itself was, was cool enough, uh, but then Zaya herself, who's now 17, got so into it that she's, our na she's now, this is a 17-year-old orphan girl, is now our prime producer of content in the Mongolian language. She is essentially the teacher for her country. And so it's, it's kind of one of these surreal sci-fi type of things and so what I want to show you now is the direction we're going in in terms of internationalization. We have 4,000 videos in English. We now have 7,000 in, I think, 20 languages. And our goal is to, frankly, have 80,000 in, in 20 languages and, and maybe more and maybe even have regional specific content. And so this next montage shows you a little taste of what those, what those other videos look like. And they're already available on the site if, you, if at the bottom there's a little bit of a drop down. And it ends with a little, uh, a little part of the, that, uh, Zaya's original video. Si sí decimos que bueno, esta fue la primera cara y esta fue la segunda cara. Y yo he yo observar ni han que ni bajado gato, os cuyo image yo he. Nega jiao, 就是正弦数值对应的角。木木是
également sur la dernière leçon mas é claro que ele fez muitas e muitas e muitas outras coisas importantes. I watch that when I get lazy. I get the... So, so I like to point out, I mean, you know, it started with me and my cousins, but I, I, I like to emphasize it's not just me anymore. It's a team of folks. We're, we're approaching 40 people. And I, and I like to emphasize, I think we're at a special time in history, a, a, you know, literally a Gutenberg moment, not even a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I literally think it's a once-in-a-millennia in a opportunity uh, where you can have real reach and real scale. And what I point out is, you know, our, our team over the last year averaged 24 employees. We've been growing quite fast, uh, but we've been able to reach 43 million unique students over the past year. And I point out if it was actually drawn to scale, that second bar uh, should be 20 kilometers high. So, you know, big picture, the, the original tagline on that was just the necessities, but there was a... <laughs> you know, big picture, education has traditionally vi viewed as a very scarce thing, a thing that's expensive, a thing that really differentiates between the haves and have-nots. Uh, even when people did philanthropy, it was always, what do the rich have? Well, that's expensive. Let's create a cheap approximation of it and let's try to give it to the poor because they had nothing before, so it's better than nothing. Uh, but what's exciting now is uh, I think we're entering a reality where we don't have to give the poor even a cheap approximation. Uh, we can give students like Zaya and the other girls in our orphanage the exact same thing that Bill Gates' children have. So we're going into a world where education isn't this scarce thing, isn't this expensive thing. So 10, 20, 30 years in the future, I, I firmly believe that it will be viewed as a human right and it will be viewed as just one of these necessities like clean drinking water, shelter, or, or electricity. And with that, I'd, I'd just like to thank you for, for having us here. Thanks a bunch. Wow. Thanks. So we're all very moved, very moved. Appreciate, appreciate. I have just one question for you. Have you ever thought about going on Jeopardy? Go ahead. I, I, th I think you would kill. I think I have more to lose than gain at this point, <laughs> yes. Um, seriously, we're all, we're all very moved by your work and, uh, and very appreciative of what you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, Adobe is, is uh, very passionate about education. Um, it's something that we invest a lot in uh, through our Adobe Foundation. Uh, and, and other ways of, of trying to just drive social change and, and community development. So uh, as, a, as a note of our appreciation, all of us here through uh, the Adobe Foundation, I'm very proud to announce that we'll be making a donation of $50,000 to the Khan Academy. Oh, thank you very much. No, that's, that's so thank you very, very much. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So wow, what a morning. <laughs>